Heyo, and what is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. And just when Monday Night Raw thought it was safe from a hammering this week, I come out of the shadows more ferocious, more vicious, and more intense than Retribution could ever even dream to be as we are about to bring the hammer down on what is undoubtedly the worst episode of Monday Night Raw I have seen all year, maybe all time. It is full of nothing but logic gaps and complete lack in creativity and we are going to go through everything wrong with this episode right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare and you are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Monday Night Raw Review and Reaction Show. Better late than never, I always say. Let's do it. <laughs> Take a look at this group. Oh my god. For months we have been watching these hooded figures show up in their little masks looking like Akira Tozawa's ninjas. We couldn't decipher between the two groups and Retribution has been showing up. They're cutting chainsaws. They're cutting, they're cutting ropes with chainsaws. They're destroying the performance center. They're taking apart rings. They're beating down superstars. They're talking shit about the WWE. They're breaking shit all over the WWE all because they haven't gotten opportunities. This is an anti WWE. WWE faction and it should be terrifying and it should be cool and it should be interesting but instead do you know what it is? It's a cheap knockoff of every 1980s Saturday morning cartoon that you didn't watch. You know all the ones you didn't watch that absolutely sucked and they weren't worth your time because you were too busy watching G.I. Joe and Transformers and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all of which have been inspirations apparently when putting together Retribution. Vince McMahon was in the back and he was like, ha ha, I want myself a new shield, but let's give them a logo reminiscent to the New World Order. Let's dress them up similar to demolition and let's jerk off all over ourselves and call it Retribution. <laughs> That's good shit, pal. Is this good shit? Look at this. You got this guy in the back. We're going to get to the names in a minute, but look at this. My daughter cut out a snowflake pattern. You know how you fold papers up and you cut the little triangles and shit out and you make a little nice snowflake pattern? Christmas is coming soon. You could do that if you never did it before. You put the snowflake up on the wall and it's nice. They went and they found a snowflake, a paper snowflake, and they stuck it to poor Shane Thorne's face. And then they wanted to call him Slapjack. Might as well have just called him Slap Nuts, because that's about as as powerful as a name like Slapjack is going to be. It's awful. It's just awful. And let's take a look at the two beautiful ladies in the bottom of the screen. Now, not only did they cover their face up with Hannibal Lecter masks, they haven't even decided on what terrible names to give them. I'm going to save them some time. Look, we've got the guy in the middle, right? We know he's Dominic or Donovan Dijakovic, whichever name you want to pick. Any of those names would have been better than T-Bar... T-Bar. T-Bar is the leader of Retribution. You might as well have called him T-Bag because he is absolutely meaningless. I don't care how menacing his voice is. I don't care that they gave him a Bane-inspired mask. I don't care at all. It's absolutely ludicrous. And the name T-Bar makes it even worse. And then to the right, you got a guy like Dio Madden. Very impressive figure. Very good. He moved very well in the ring. This guy could be a superstar, even with that ridiculous mask on. It could have been something cool. But they wanted to just call him Mace. Mace, like Mace Windu from Star Wars. Or Macy Gray, the old musical singer. Or maybe... Who the hell knows what the hell this man was thinking when he came up with this ridiculousness. So let's go over the list, shall we? We have Teabag, we have Slapnuts, and we got Mush. We'll call him Mush. Now, really, their names are T-Bar, Mace, and Slapjack. So what are they going to come up with for Mia Yim and for Mercedes Martinez? Might as well just call them Bebop and Rocksteady and be done with it. 
this whole thing is ridiculous and we're just talking about on just looking at them based on their look and their name this is only the beginning because the the way that this group of clowns debuted tonight holy cow does it make even less sense more and more as we go along i'm i'm going to get rid of this cuz i'm i'm sick and tired of looking at it i was tired of seeing it on monday night and all I wanted to do was get here and talk with you guys about what the hell we had all just sat through. But as some of you may know, my computer was giving me issues. We've gotten those out of the way. The kinks are out of the system and we're back in the system. And we are going to come here with more fire and more ferocity. Everything Retribution wishes they were, that's what we are going to give to you. Because I'm hot, man. I'm heated with this. You've wasted months and months of our time. With this evolution storyline. For months. These guys have been talking trash about WWE. Talking about how WWE is a disease. The superstars are worthless. They haven't gotten their opportunities. And this is why they're coming to WWE. They're bringing the fight to the WWE. Never once did they ask to be contracted. Or to be part of the show. They were the anti-WWE establishment. So when it first started, with the exception of the stupid appearance with the with little ski masks and stuff, they had a decent concept. We have an outside faction coming in. They want to start trouble, and they don't really want anything to do with the WWE except create chaos. All they created was, like, cartoon-style chaos, stuff you'd see on Looney Tunes with Bugs Bunny chasing Daffy Duck and doing stupid shit like that. That's what we've gotten with Retribution. Just a bunch of bad beat-down segments, throwing cinder blocks through windows, setting shit on fire, breaking down the ring with a chainsaw, all this crazy stuff. And naturally, the WWE decides, well, let's take these guys that hate us and let's sign them to a contract. Not just a normal contract, but a contract that's going to allow them to do whatever they want, seemingly with no ramifications whatsoever. How does that make sense at all? Now, first of all, there are a few reasons why this is really illogical. First and foremost is the fact that all of these jerk-offs are already under contract. They're already WWE employees. I'm not stupid. You're not stupid. We all know who they are. We all know they're from NXT. Hence, they're already contracted to the company. So this whole thing, oh, signed contracts for Raw, I... No. No, it doesn't make sense. I don't care what's going down the line. If they're going to have a higher power in some sort of fashion that has done this. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The thing you think they would want is to file a restraining order not offer them up contracts that give them carte blanche to do whatever the hell they want. How ridiculous is that? Number two, why are they getting rewarded for all of these terrible actions? Most people would be arrested, but instead these guys are now going to get paid to cause chaos, the same ridiculous chaos we've been seeing them cause over the course of the last couple of months. Third, why would Retribution want to be part of this company? As we highlighted, the way they've been talking about it, the way they've been really shady with the way they've mentioned WWE and how they're almost like trying to paint WWE to be the evil entity that us fans all know it to be. But it doesn't make sense if they hate WWE so much, why would they agree to a contract? They should have ripped the contract up threw it in somebody's face, and told them, we don't want to work here, we just want to destroy this place. And not only did they fail on the reveal of the members just based off of the look and the names, but if you think about it, all of these members of Retribution have don't have a leg to stand on because they've had opportunities, and they're already part of the company. So it's kind of stupid. There was a lot of speculation that they were going to get some of the guys that they fired to come back after they fired everybody a couple of months back. But they didn't do anything interesting like that. What they did was they took five names randomly. I'm sure they picked them randomly from NXT, put them in this, threw the shit at the wall, and hoped that it stuck. But it didn't. It ran down the wall, and it stunk up your living room just like it stunk up mine, and we all hate it. We all absolutely hate it. 
Then those ridiculous masks that Vince picked up from a local spirit Halloween store on his way to the arena that day didn't help things. They took the whole Thunderdome theme to new heights with this with these Mad Max looking rejects. Is that what it is? Because it's a Thunderdome, we have to have these weird Mad Max looking people. You got people talking about them being part of the Foot Clan. People are talking about them being all kinds of stupid things. Slipknot, I've heard. All these different things that everybody's been calling them. And they are all 100% accurate because it is ridiculous. Think about it. With the na- Couldn't they have just named them or do what WWE loves to do the most? Just take half of their actual name away, right? You got Donovan or Dominic Dijakovic. Just call him Dijak or Dijakovic. He's the leader of Retribution, Dijakovic. You have Dijakovic. You have uh, Dio. Dio's a great name. Never been used in wrestling before. Named after a, a famous rock and roll star. You could have had Dijakovic, Dio, Thorn. Call Shane Thorn. Just call him Thorn. That's way, way better than Slapjack. And then you got Mia and Mercedes. One name. That's it. Mia, Mercedes. Five names, none of which sound like ass. None of which sound like they came out of the pages of a comic book. None of which sound like proof of Vince McMahon completely, totally being out of touch. Because that's what this is. These are guys in their 70s and 60s who remember when things were cool back in the day. So let's do some cool thing. Let's call let's call the arena the Thunderdome. That'll be cool. Let's call this guy T-Bar. So instead of Dijakovic, Dio, Thorn, Mia, and Mercedes, we got Teabag, Mush, Slapnuts, Bebop, and Rockstead. Get out of here with this retribution nonsense. And that was just the icing on a very, very disgusting cake that was colored in red and we call Monday Night Raw. Aside from that, there was not one redeeming thing on this show. The entire three hours was full of nonsense. For example, the tag team division, seeing the Street Profits looking for new challengers for the Raw Tag Team Championships. And what are the three teams the WWE come up with here? Buddy Murphy and Seth Rollins, who have somewhat broken up and are going through some troubling times. Then you got Garza and Andrade, who broke up last week and is now without Zelina Vega. And then this team of Umberto Dr. Dimples Carrillo and Dominic Mysterio, both of which haven't won shit. They haven't been in a tag team with each other, maybe ever. And if I'm forgetting that it actually happened at some point, there's probably a good reason for that. But think about it. Why are these two guys being given any sort of a championship opportunity just because the Dominic Mysterio has gotten Vince McMahon's eyes right now and he's really high on this kid, so let's just nonsensically put him in a championship opportunity without any logic or reason behind it. Just random, completely totally random. And then, of course, we have this triple threat match. The Street Profits are watching on the outside. They actually say that they would like it to be Umberto and Dominic. And I'm sitting here thinking it's gonna be. I'm watching this match thinking they're gonna give this to to this kid and and Dr. Dimples. Because Rollins and Mysterio got their own thing. I'm, I'm sorry. Rollins and Murphy got their own thing going on. And Garza and Andrade... Why are they even still a team? We've seen that match 150,000 times. There's no way they would make it 151,000 times. But they did. And at the end of this thing, Garza and Andrade won their 1,051th opportunity to get another rematch for the championships at the crap of champions this Sunday. Because everybody's so clamoring to see that. You think just because you took Zelina Vega out of the equation that it's going to change anything? And if they win the championships this Sunday from the Street Profits, how stupid does it really make them look? I don't know. It was absolutely ridiculous. Just about as ridiculous as Kevin Owens inviting Shane McMahon on the Kevin Owens show. That sentence alone is ridiculous. Despite their history, Despite their deep-seated hatred for one another, 
these two guys decide we're going to bury the hatchet tonight, and Kevin Owens is completely fine with it because he's going to allow Shane McMahon to promote the Raw garbage dump match between Braun Strowman and Yapple Dapple Kato, or whatever the fuck his name is. Yabba Dabba, which Wrestle Talk wanted to steal from me. That's fine. That's fine. Just like they wanted to steal my hammer with their little pledge hammer thing. That's fine. It's fine. We're all friends here, I think. Anyway, back on track. They buried the hatchet so Shane can promote this fight. And then Kevin Owens gets his ass kicked by Aleister Black, who's still, I guess, partially blind, but we will never really know because he's going to constantly wear his solid snake eye patch, looking like Captain Hook. Crotches Kevin Owens in the corner, smashes his nuts about three times. And Dabakato and Braun Strowman and Shane McMahon don't give a shit. They don't care. Nobody's watching. Nobody's selling anything. Shane McMahon won't let the two big behemoths fight because, you know, they're promoting it for the garbage dump. The underground, if you don't know what I'm talking about. We call it the garbage dump here. Or the dumping ground. The raw dumping ground is more like it. Absolutely useless. And a slap in the face to all of our intelligences. And to think that Kevin Owens would just be okay with this so that he could slap Yabba Dabba in the face... To get some revenge for what Yabba Dabba did in the underground last week? It's so fucking stupid. It really is. Just like it was very stupid for them to even involve Keith Lee with Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton. I know that some of you guys are probably going to disagree with me, but the, the push of Keith Lee has been absolutely underwhelming. And this was another unimpressive showing by the Limitless One, showing that his limits are definitely there on the main roster, and they're called Vince McMahon. Because he put this guy in a box, he put him in a position where he could say, well, I put him in the main event. I put him in the main event spot. He's wrestling with Drew McIntyre. That's wrong. It's all wrong. Because the guy's had about eight matches, he's only won two, and every time he loses, he's losing by disqualification. And you think that's a way to keep him protected? He should have been brought up and dominated through the singles ranks from from bottom all the way up to the mid card. Give him a shot at the U.S. title. Get him real solid momentum so that by the time we get to Mania and Keith Lee is ready for the championship, you have Keith Lee win at WrestleMania. That's Wrestling 101, how to get a superstar over. But instead, you thrust him right into the limelight. You put him in the middle of Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton, who you never intended to take out of the match. Keith Lee keeps getting these opportunities. This is a rematch from last week. Keith Lee gets another chance to, to be the substitute for Randy Orton if Randy Orton can't make the match. We all knew Randy Orton was going to be in this match. I thought this whole thing with Keith Lee was going to lead to his insertion into the championship matchup, leading to a triple threat before they did all this ambulance bullshit, which would have allowed Keith Lee to not even play a factor in the decision, and he wouldn't have had to win, he wouldn't have had to lose, and they could have went on about their business, he would have got main event status, he would have got main event spotlight, and he would have been brought up a little bit. That would have been fine. But now, he's an afterthought. He got RKO'd or punt kicked again by, by Randy Orton. Keith Lee's practically dead in the water. Between his underwhelming debut and then the his run of matches where he's only won twice... What did they do? They killed this guy. All of those weeks that they put into Keith Lee, what were they really meant to do? What was the point of it all? To thrust him into the spotlight and then push him down to the mid-card? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Zelina Vega beats Mickey James tonight for an opportunity at Asuka at the Crap of Champions, and I'm a huge fan of Zelina Vega. She's a hometown girl, she's from Queens, New York, just like me, and I've always been a strong supporter of her. I think she's been one of the best managers of the current generation. There's not many, but she's definitely got that job down, and I am fully in support of her being put into the spotlight right now. But let's be fair. Let's be fair. As much as I love Zelina Vega, 
And as much as I as I have told you guys on countless t- countless times on this show that she can go in the ring, does she deserve a championship opportunity after winning one match? She hasn't wrestled in a singles match on Raw in over two years. She wins one match, and she's getting a championship opportunity versus Asuka. Something is just a little wrong with that. Just a little bit. I'm not saying she doesn't deserve it as a person. I'm saying the character that she portrays has not earned the opportunity to go up against Asuka. Am I wrong about that? Let me know in the comments down below. Oh, by the way, during the, hey, look at me, I don't give a shit, I'm a clown, 24-7, avocado, toast, gold-plated championship segment of the night, Akira Tozawa was eaten by a shark. Yeah, I said that. I just said that. Because it happened. You know why it happened? Because it's good shit. It's actually dog shit. Just like everything they're doing with the Hurt Business which is one of the most confusing things I think any casual fan will have to sit through because we got Cedric Alexander, who's now clearly a heel, with the Hurt Business, that is clearly a heel faction. But Cedric, after this new refreshing heel persona was given to him, went out there tonight and lost. He lost to Apollo Crews. Why did he lose? Because Ricochet came out and distracted Cedric just long enough for Apollo Crews to gain the... Are we really still watching this round robin of matches between these guys that just move on already? Move on already. And you're confusing everybody as it is because the Hurt Business are heels here, but to, to fight retribution, they're the good guys. And you want us to cheer for them there, but you want us to hate Cedric here and you want us to hate MVP and hate Bobby Lashley as Apollo Crews is going to get another shot at Bobby Lashley's United States Championship this Sunday at the Crap of Champions. Are we supposed to cheer him versus Apollo Crews? I don't understand. Where are you going with this? Why is the heel faction of the Hurt Business taking on the heel faction of Retribution? Like I said, and we'll say a bunch times more, the show didn't make any sense. And is absolutely illogical. As it has always been, but this may be the worst I have seen it. And to make matters worse... Hey, <laughs> take Mollies! <laughs> I'm still with Rey Mysterio. This feud has got to die. It has to go away. It's already going down in flames. It has to go away. We've seen this ad nauseum for months and months and months between the eye for an eye and then the rise of Dominic and then this whole shit with Buddy Murphy. Man, 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 take mountains. TV time, man. This is the best they got. They have Seth Rollins come out and rehash a storyline. <coughs> Excuse me, that Seth Rollins voice is hurting me as much as watching Raw hurt me. They have him rehash a storyline from 15 years ago. Seth Rollins is standing in the middle of the ring with papers claiming that Dominic Mysterio is not the son of Rey Mysterio. And all I could do is keep my hands on my face like this because I I was trying to rub out the pain of the migraine that was slowly building up by having to watch this crap. And then something very odd happens. First, this was way too long. It was so drawn out. It was just a desperate opportunity to get more interest in a storyline that's been as dead as disco. And these papers proving that Dominic apparently is not the son of Rey Mysterio, were magically turned into results that said that it was Aaliyah and not Dominic that is not Rey Mysterio's. What? You want to roll that back? You want to run that by me again, Mr. Rollins? Rey Mysterio wasn't shaken by what you said about Dominic, so you just up and shifted gears and said, oh no, these papers are probably, my guy probably got it wrong, and this is probably about your daughter. Then Rey Mysterio stands up for his daughter, calling her naive because she's 19, which is not really something that bad to say. And then little Aaliyah gets mad at daddy and goes running into the back for some unknown reason. 
right? So now this is all leading towards one very obvious thing. And they're pointing towards this love story between Buddy Murphy and Aaliyah. All because she checked how he was after Seth Rollins beat the shit out of him last week after the cage match. So now here we are. And later in the show, after this really long and boring and ridiculous paternity segment for Seth Rollins, after he he pisses off the Mysterios and they go running away to do their Mysterio drama, he apologizes and he's like, oh, well, I didn't mean to drive a wedge through the Mysterios. It just comes off so stupid. So stupid. He should have at least done his stupid <laughs> I did it laugh or something. Pretend that you're a heel at least. But now he's standing there trying to be genuine. I didn't mean I I didn't mean to cause a wet. Shut up. Shut up. And then you cut to Buddy Murphy in the back talking to a distraught Aaliyah. And they're all weird and uncomfortable, and you can see that they're heading towards this romance angle, right? And I'm sitting here going, a 30-year-old dude chasing a 19-year-old who looks like she's 12 is not something that I'm up for. This guy looks like he could be her dad. He does. Or at least her creepy uncle. They do not fit, and I'm trying to figure out how does any of this help Dominic Mysterio? Isn't he the focal point here? Why are we shifting to this? We're going to have to see Dominic versus Buddy Murphy a million times. What, for the honor of Aaliyah? To keep Aaliyah in the Rey Mysterio family? Are they going to give her a mask? Are they going to I don't know. Are they going to give Dominic a mask? Are they going to do anything interesting or, or, or no? Or no. They're just going to give retribution masks because what the hell? They've been in masks all this time. Might as well keep them in some other little ass masks. That whole thing with Rollins and the Mysterios, like I said, it needs to be done. It needs to be over. At least it is in my opinion because it is not interesting. And you got everybody poking their head. Oh, well, that could be interesting. No, it can't be interesting. It's going to be fucking terrible. If everything that they have done with the Mysterios and Rollins preceding this has been terrible, what do you think is going to happen when they involve little Aaliyah? And it's not her fault. I'm not saying she's a bad actress. I'm not saying she doesn't deserve an opportunity. But this is definitely not the story they need to be telling with this girl. It's fucking awful. About as awful as seeing Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler take on Lana and Natty again for the sole reason. There's no other reason for this match to exist. They had the Riot Squad out there watching, scouting the champions apparently. But the only reason this match existed is so that when it was over, Nia Jax can for the second time put Lana through a table again. Now, we all know I'm not the biggest proponent of Lana. I am i don't really care for her character. I don't care at all. But this is blatant, blatant bullshittery by the WWE. Two weeks in a row. And the segment was exactly the same as last week. As if Nia didn't put her through the table hard enough the first time, Vince said, get out there and do it again. Rusev is in AEW now. Put her through a table, Jax. Because what else was the point of it? There was zero. Just like there was zero point in breaking up the Iconics. Because this week we got Peyton Royce, whose push is apparently back on. And she's out there with Billy Kay. They have this little interview segment where they think they're clever. And they want to say, well, we can't be a tag team anymore. But we can still be friends. What? Friends? Why would Billy Kay still want to be friends with Peyton Royce? I don't care about their history. Let's just talk about this for a second. They broke this team up for no reason at all, because all they really had to do was say, Peyton's going to go for singles championship now, and I'm going to support her. The Iconics are still a thing, but it's all about Peyton now. Very easy way to do that, if this was truly their intention, to keep Billy Kay on the outside the whole time. But instead... The whole last two months of the Iconics' work has been meaningless. Because Peyton broke up with Billy Kay. She broke up with Billy Kay. In the ring for all of us to see. She then fed her former partner to the underground. 
throwing her to Shayna Baszler's thugs, the four horsewomen of MMA, while they were in the underground. That already makes you seem like this girl would not want to be friends anymore. And then Peyton beat Billy's ass on Monday Night Raw. And then they had a little hug it out moment at the end, which I said at that time was bullshit. And that one or the other of these girls should have just ripped on the other one and kill the Iconics are done, let them be done. But no, that's not what happened here. They're still friends, and they're still going to support each other. So we're still going to have the Iconics, only they're not the Iconics. Who gives a shit? All of this was done just to put Peyton Royce in a match with Asuka that gets thrown out thanks to Zelina Vega getting involved. So it was really all pointless filler to try to generate interest in a championship match that was only made a couple of hours earlier in the show that we have to see this Sunday. (laughs) I can't make this stuff up. If I made this stuff up, it would be better. Braun Strowman defeats Yapple Dapple Yabba Dabba Kato. In the raw garbage dump. In the dumping ground. Yabba Dabba is dead. Braun Strowman is is one of the worst written characters in the company. He's just lost the Universal Championship. And he went to Shane McMahon's sweat box. Also known as the raw dumping ground. And now he's a winner? This is the same place where Dolph Ziggler's winning matches now. But the one interesting thing you had in the underground was this guy, Dabakato. And in one fell swoop, you made him worthless by having him lose to a guy who's more worthless than Dabakato would have been. Dabba's the bigger man. He's got a better look. We haven't seen him for the last three years be a tremendous failure. So naturally, you're going to take that guy and shit all over him. Just like they did to Keith Lee. Dabba Kato. Can Dabba Kato out of here? Who's going to give a shit? I already lost interest. And then, of course, the main event. Teabag, Slap Nuts and Mush took on the Hurt Business. And one of the things that piss me off more than just the existence of retribution itself was the way WWE decided to finish this. This match didn't need to happen. You got Survivor Series around the corner. You could have very easily saved this whole encounter. But you have... (laughs) I can't even say these names without laughing. You have Slap Nuts being beaten down by Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley has got him in the hurt lock. Okay? Teabag punches at Bobby Lashley, trying to free his partner from the submission, and Retribution gets disqualified. Let me say it again. Because he tried to break up a submission so that his partner wouldn't tap out, which last time I checked was a completely legal thing to do in a tag team scenario. Imagine how many championships would have been lost or won if the if the person's partner couldn't come in and make that save. You don't get disqualified for making a save. That's just the cherry on top. That's just the cherry on top of a match that shouldn't even exist. It ended with another big brawl, Retribution, then multiplied like gremlins once again. There was about 50,000 of them out there versus the four members of the Hurt Locker. And then the raw backstage, everybody came running out and made this whole big brawl led by Drew McIntyre. And then Drew McIntyre gets hit with an RKO, you know, because they have to promote that match. In the midst of this Retribution angle where everything should be about them, They made it about this, and then Raw went off the air. And there's a million more things we could say (laughs) about Retribution and how terrible this show as a whole is, but there's just not enough time in the day for, (laughs) for any of that. 
and we will be able to come back and talk about it more because this, ladies and gentlemen, has only just begun. As terrible as it is, we got to get used to Teabag, Slapnuts, and Mush with their female members, members yet to be named. And good God, it's terrible. I, I really hope that they see how bad the backlash has been and and try to change something about the team. Maybe get rid of the fucking masks. The names will never get over. It's it's true. WrestleVotes said these guys are already facing an uphill battle just based off of their appearance and their names alone. And I couldn't agree more. Thank you guys so much for coming and joining me on this late edition of the Monday Night Raw Review. You know, I wasn't going to let this get away. I was not going to let this get away at all. I spent the last two days trying to fix this box. So I just had this computer built a year ago. I shouldn't be getting blue screens all over the place. All right? I don't understand it. But I think we got it under control. We will be back this Friday for the SmackDown review. And then we will be back to bring the hammer down on the crap of champions. Which I can already tell you, I, I have no interest. Wrestling is just terrible now. It really is, especially in the WWE. You know what's not terrible? Sitting here and talking to you guys. Thank you once again for being part of this show. Sorry that it came up so late, but I hope you had a good time here with me tonight. If you did, make sure you smash that thumbs up if you got any kind of value from this video. Share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, especially if they need to see everything that was wrong with this show, especially Retribution. And then, of course, if you are not already a Sledgehead, come on and join the family. Hit that subscribe button right now and become one of the coolest, newest, hottest members of the best faction in the YouTube wrestling community, my Sledgeheads of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. So do all those things for me. Like, share, and subscribe. It definitely helps the channel. You can watch the commercials if you could. I would appreciate it. Definitely helps the channel. And maybe, if you feel like it, Go grab yourself an official Sledgehammer Wrestling Show mask, still available at teespring.com slash store slash sledgehammer dash TV, where there is also other merch available. Pick and choose what you like. You don't have to get the masks. You can get yourself a t-shirt. And the winter's coming. We're going to be putting up some hoodies and some sweatshirts soon as well for you guys to get your hands on. And this whole entire show was a gigantic <laughs> poop hammer. And you all knew it. Thank you all. So, very much again, if you missed anything on this channel that I do, it will all be linked in the annotations up above. That, my friends, is going to do it. We are out of here, and we will see you next time. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is Thor, the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, his tag team partner, the world heavyweight champion of all the microphones in all the world, Mr. Blue the Snowball. That is going to do it. We're out of here. We'll see you next time on your new favorite wrestling show, The Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube.com. Slap nuts! <laughs>